Hello, I'm Ron Miscavige, and this is Life After Scientology. Welcome to our episode. I got to get a drink of water before I start. I got a tickle in my throat. Hey, to your health. Okay, so I have a special treat for you today because I managed to get a gentleman back on who was on an earlier episode. And we never got around to covering some of the points that I thought were very interesting. And one of those points is the story of the incredible string band and a girl by the name of Licky McKechnie. It's really a great story. And that's what we're going to cover today. So I welcome you back. And my guest this morning is a gentleman you heard a while back. His name is Brian Lampert. I say Lampert. What the hell am I saying for it? It's Lambert, right? Is Lambert, that right? yeah. Yeah. Are you sure it's Lambert, not Lampert? You know? I'm pretty sure, yeah. I'm almost, that's what my mom and dad said. Okay. So look, you already saw him. So the cat's out of the bag. And by the way, I like your hat. That, Thank you. A great looking hat there. Anyway, yes, this morning, please welcome back Brian Lambert. And if you haven't seen his earlier episode, I recommend it highly, but meanwhile, we're into this one. So let's get rolling. And um, to open it up with Brian, uh, we were talking, oh, I don't know, a while ago about Ron being a great hypnotist. Do you have any insight into that or anybody who was around him or when this was happening? Let, let's get into that to start off with. Okay. Okay. Um, I wrote an essay um, on a writing called altitude instruction i read altitude instruction years ago when i was in scientology and then when i was out within the last couple of years i reread it again and a light bulb went off in my head and that uh, regarding ron and that light bulb was l ron hubbard was conscious and deliberate in in being expert at manipulating it wasn't just pure uh, goodness out of his heart. I mean, I, I do believe Ron in his delusion felt he was the only way. I felt he was, he fought it the wisest man. That was part of the narcissistic thing about him. But in this writing called Altitude Instruction, Ron talks about, and with a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge, he talks about how you can hypnotize other people without putting them under in the standard hypnotizing way. So for instance, if I can raise my altitude, if I can make you think, I, okay, for, let's say if you wanted to be an actor and, I, and you meet me for the first time and I say to you, I'm best friends with, uh, with all of the stars in Hollywood, immediately, boink, I become this high altitude to you. Right. And anything that I say, you're going to go, oh, so-and-so says this because you, know, you may want to like know me better and you may want to connect to all the people that I know. So I have this power over you because I have made, raised my altitude. In altitude instruction, Ron had total certainty on how to do that. And he discusses it. He discusses how you can manipulate people. You can, you can, you can get them to do things. Uh, you can hypnotize them without hypnotizing them. So when I read this, I went, ah, oh, that's how he did Scientology. That's how he did it. And then I remembered this YouTube video I saw on, online. You could, you could Google it, uh, Forrest J. Ackerman on L. Ron Hubbard. Now, Forrey Ackerman was Ron's publicist back in the day. And uh, I did a movie called The Sci-Fi Boys where Forrey Ackerman created the term sci-fi. And he was definitely somebody, he was a student of science fiction and that's why he really liked Ron and why he worked with Ron. But in this YouTube video that you could find now, he talks about that he was in a gathering with Ron and Ron had this person see a dancing kangaroo on in the palm of his hand. So Ron hypnotized this guy to actually see a, a, a kangaroo dancing in the hand. And Fari's saying, yeah, I saw this happen. L. Ron Hubbard knew how to do that. Okay. And it's also probably why in a lot of his earlier writings, he's always talking about hypnotism. He's always talking about being hypnotized because Ron was an expert hypnotist. He right. doesn't say this to people. Now, that's also how he accomplished Scientology. He accomplished Scientology 
by creating such an altitude. And one of those altitudes he created was, I am the Messiah, that I am, and this is one of the things that worked on me, on him of Asia. He said that he was the predicted prophet of the Buddha. And me being a child of the 60s who is really into Eastern mysticism, I'm thinking to myself, Oh, my God, a prophet of the Buddha, Maitreya, is back on earth to free mankind. I must give up my life to help the Buddha. Mm. That's altitude instruction. He raised his altitude to create such a confidence in him that we then were, 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 uh, would follow his words and do whatever he did. Just like that man seeing an, uh, a, a kangaroo dancing in his hand. Right. L. Ron Hubbard was able to make us all see him in ways that he wanted. That was hypnotism without us going under with the watch, look into my eyes. He right. hypnotized us. He knew what he was doing. He did it consciously. He was an expert at it. Okay. I'm sorry, were you going to say something else? No, I just, every time I talk about it, I just, my brain goes, holy shit, this guy was good. Man, well, he he was really good at at being a con man he he was such a genius with words and his energy had such confidence uh that we you know at some point a person goes up the bridge and then they start believing in the most weirdest things in the world like space i, I do agree and by the way getting back to the uh metraya you, you mentioned that you were a child of the 60s and you know you read about buddha and everything I was in the musical unit when we wrote that piece called The Hymn of Asia. Do you remember that? I do, actually. And you're talking about that idea sinking into my head at that point, because I was already in the sea organization, you know, trying to help mankind. When so we, it happened to you, too. Oh, you know, when we did that, I mean, Jesus Christ, it was like, wow, look at what I'm doing. This is so important. Yeah, exactly. And And, and you think that, and that's... That's part of the con. As a matter of fact, I personally think that Scientology could be the greatest con that was ever run on the planet. Now, what the hell am I saying that from? What background? Well, I don't know, except it's so clever. And there are a lot of people who are in Scientology who are not stupid. I mean, this you have some brilliant people, some great artists. And uh, it was sold to them, and they bought it hook, line, and sinker, just like I did and just like many of us. And until you can look in the mirror one day and say, you know what? I was conned. You're still under the spell. You, you've got to be able to do that, and you got to do it with full realization of what you're saying to yourself. Right. Anyway, uh, okay, so do you have any idea how, how this works, how the hypnotist works or is that just another subject we're not going to get into well i mean all we have to do ron is just remember what happened to us and then you know what happened to all of us uh, and then we realize how good he was i mean that's how good he was he he was able to to con doctors mathematicians scientists and yeah. uh, he was he was able to make that kangaroo dance in all of our hands and it was very real to us yeah he, and well, he also got us with every now and again, he did, he, okay, in auditing, when we go within to look in auditing, I always say, you know, when a person turns their attention inside to look, they're going to come up with some knowledge. They're going to come up with some realization about their lives. Why? Because they're stopping the world and they're turning within and they're looking. So just by the very fact of going within oneself and looking, they're going to have realizations because that's yeah. where realizations occur. Yeah. So beautiful things happen in auditing for people. I'm, I, I have no doubt about that. But unfortunately, they were the cheese because he also introduces insanity, his insanity, his, his sociopathy and his malignant narcissism also gets transferred to the Scientologists, which are, which are the OSA people that are listening right now that we feel so sorry for. <laughs> <laughs> Well, go no. back to your families. Go back to your families. Get out while you can. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll tell you, I think you're right because it was so cleverly done. You didn't know you were being hypnotized. Exactly. And that's, that's the real skill of it as far as I'm concerned. Okay. We'll let that subject for right now because I don't have a definitive answer for it. 
and I don't want to get into bullshit about it because I took okay. It well, but one one thing I think is how to how to unhypnotize. I think is an important one. Go back, look at the early books that that you've read, and 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 comb through some of the the, the ideas and and find those areas where you went. I think this is true. Okay, Th that's the moment where you go under. Yeah, that I tell you, that's good advice. I, that, I'm glad I pursued it just that little bit further. And look at along these lines. Didn't L. Ron Herbert think he was the Antichrist? Yes. In fact, uh, I started this uh, thread on Marty's blog a few years back. Uh, I brought up the OT8 materials where Ron said that he was Lucifer and Jesus was a pedophile and he was the Antichrist. And then Marty came back and said, no, I've done some research on that and found out that that's not true. And then George M. White, who did the original OT8, I think in 1986, he chimed in and said, no, uh, no, Marty, uh, you're wrong. I was on the ship and that did happen. And then another person came in and said, I was on the ship and that was not the OT8 that I read. And then another person came on and said, I was on the ship and that is the OT8 that I read. And what we found out was that the people that first went on, uh, I'm not sure if it was the Apollo or the Free Winds at that point, but I think it was the Free Winds. It was the it, Free Winds, yeah. Yeah. So the original OT8 people all had this, this course, and part of the course was studying that Ron was talking about who he was and what the purpose of his, re his incarnation was. And in it, Ron states, oh, by the way, uh, another person chimed in and said, yes, I, did, I took the original course. I think three people chimed in and said, I took the original course. And then Marty said, could you send me those records so that I could read them? And then it started an entire th thread, and then... People from all over the blogosphere were listening in on that. And then that particular thread went all over the place. Uh, and then people started talking about Ron the Antichrist uh, all over the world, and all over the blogs. And I felt really proud about starting that particular one. <laughs> but, wow. Um, so basically, Ron says that he is the, uh, the prediction in the, in the uh, uh, revelations of the Antichrist. He says... I am the predicted Antichrist that was talked about in the Bible. This is what he says. And then he says that, uh, that love and understanding is a Markab conspiracy. And then he says, Jesus Christ was a pedophile. Okay, so right there, without going into metaphysics or religion or religious doc doctrine or dogma, we can say that L. Ron Hubbard was an antichrist because he's saying that Jesus, who most hu human beings who believe in him or not believe in him, was a benevolent character who, who, who was a giving person who taught love your fellow man as one of the most important doctrines to follow in the world. So here we have L. Ron Hubbard saying that he's Lucifer, and he's saying that that Jesus Christ was a pedophile and was uh, 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 given to bouts of anger is what he said. So we can rightly say that L. Ron Hubbard was an anti-Christ because that statement is anti-Jesus, anti-Christ. Right. Now, well, he also studied with Aleister Crowley and he studied with Jack Parsons which is on the dark side of the metaphysical spectrum where love is not the uh, quality that you're trying to attain, but power is the quality that you're trying to attain. And what does Scientology have? What is the OT levels about? It's about power. Yeah. It's about being cause over. It's about doing things with matter, you know, moving matter with your mind, making people do things. It's about yeah. being cause. So, the evil aspect of Ron was that he literally sought evil. He, it, was, it was his predisposition. Uh, some of his quotes that to me is circumstantial evidence to prove the fact that Ron was, was on the dark side of the metaphysical spectrum. He says, I am not interested in wog morality. This is a quote by him. I, I am do not remember that. I do remember that, Brian. And then he says, we are not moralists. He says that too, quote, so we are not moralists. 
I am not interested in wog morality. Okay, so what I would love people to do is go to the dictionary and Google morality. Just Google the word morality. And, and then remember, Ron says, we are not moralists. So that's what Ron's against. Ron is against morality. And metaphysically evil people are not into morality because morality governs behavior. And evil people don't want their behavior governed because they want to do what they want to do because that's the whole idea of the negative dark side. It's fulfilling your own desires, getting what you want uh, at the expense of others and sympathy and love be damned. Uh, so we can rightly say that Ron sought uh, a dark side of the metaphysical spectrum and lived it and applied it. Yeah, uh, I, do, I do agree. Yeah, I do agree now that I look at it, but when I'm with it, when I was in it, I was a Kool-Aid drinker in so many words. I completely agree. Uh, it was, I had, Ron, I had the toughest time when I was in the science, when I was in Scientology to communicate to my fellow Scientologists and auditors and CSs about God. I mean, whenever I talked about God, uh, uh, people just always associated that I was being implanted, that I was dramatizing an implant. So yeah. L. Ron Hubbard, the path of, of Scientology, I, you know what? It's really not a spiritual path. It's not no. a path of the spirit at all. It's a path of power. Yeah. Well, it's a, a, a path of power that you don't attain. That you don't attain. Yeah. I mean, that That's the carrot before the donkey, but it's an illusion. Yes. Because in all the years I was in, and I was involved in Scientology for 42 years, I never met one person who could, as a spiritual being, get out of his body, go into another place, another country, another room, and tell me what was going on there. That's I the hypnotized people, part. I would have people pretend they did it, and then they would use this as an excuse. And I, I remember this distinctly. I may have given this example before, but I'm going to give it again. There was a friend of mine who I worked with when I was in the sea organization. And we were in this room one time and we were trying to get into another room, but the door was locked. And one of the people in the room says, well, look at your OTA. Why don't you unlock that door for us? And he says, oh no, I'm not going to do that. I did it one time before and the person's looking at it got very sick. So I'm not going to do it again. In other words, that was a story he had made up so he wouldn't have to take off the cloak and see that there was nothing there. He couldn't do it, but that was his story excusing himself from not having to do it, and the person accepted it. Do you follow me? I completely follow you. That happened to me, too, with uh, my first wife, Licky. She was uh, on the OT levels, and I asked her to do some tricks before I was a... Uh, uh, you know, knew anything about the OT levels and her, her take on it was, um, that I had a hidden standard. Oh, that, that was in Scientology, you know, the word of you have some preconceived notion that's not true. And so I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, Ron says that you're supposed to be cause over this and cause over that. And, uh, so basically you're saying to me that you're not cause over this and cause over that for some other Scientology reason, which is part of the hypnotism. Yeah, that's, that's it. Oh, yeah. And I will tell you something in the early, like maybe in the 70s, late 70s, there was videos made by people at the flag land base. This is in the 70s where they said you will be able to go exterior with full perception. They don't say that anymore. You know, Ron, and that's I like to bring that up for some of the old timers that may be listening. When I got in, when Ron was still alive, um, the bridge to total of freedom, that grade chart that goes up to the top, that was promoted as complete. That was promoted as all you have to, Ron mapped it out to total freedom. All you have to do now is put your feet on the bridge and walk the path to total freedom. He promoted that it was all done. Now, right. at the top of the tones, at the top of the, of the grade chart, Ron said, when you get to here, you will be able to be exterior of your body with full perception. That was the original cheese uh, in the early days for, for people to get into Scientology. Yep. They don't promote that anymore. But the original one was you're going to be able to get out of your body at will. Yeah, You're going to be able to be at cause 
over the entire material world, move objects, fly around the universe like a, and so who doesn't want to do that? Who doesn't want to like leave their bodies and fly to the moon? You know, it's so sure, sign me up. Yeah. It was all just a lie. Boy, I'll tell you, I'd love to have one of those earlier grade charts. I yeah. know if anybody's watching this who uh, is an ex Scientologist and has it, if you could copy or send me a soft copy, I'd love to have it for the show. I feel I feel really sorry, Ron, for the people that did those levels that never attained them, yeah. that couldn't know that they didn't, because if they knew that they didn't attain it, they'd be criticizing L. Ron Hubbard uh, yeah. technology. So yeah. th they become crazy. Maybe that's why they start getting cancer at the OT levels is that they start becoming full of these ideas that are counter to the truth of their own experience. Yeah. Listen, I'll give you an example of uh, OT8. A guy who does the voiceovers for a lot of the Scientology videos, and he does them at the international base where I was posted my entire time in a sea organization, came back from Flag, and he did two things. He bought himself a Lamborghini, and he bought all three of the L's. Now, if OT8 is the top of the bridge, you need to do the L rundowns then? These are considered to be uh, boosters for your uh, spiritual power. But isn't OT8 at the top of the bridge? In other words, it's all smoke and mirrors. That's and all. Ron Harvard was still running BTs after he created OT8. Yeah, I know that. And I know that from people who were at the ranch with him. And of course, I think in a previous episode, you mentioned about Sarge. Uh, you remember that? Yes, I do. Sarge to build an E-meter that would electrocute him to get rid of the BTs? What the hell, man? Ron wanted to commit suicide and to free BTs. That is what that is what where auditing took L. Ron Hubbard. Auditing took L. Ron Hubbard to the point of wanting to commit suicide to free himself from the imagining, imagine the imaginary beings that his nightmares were impinging upon him. What a wonderful way to achieve a goal. Wow, now I can commit suicide. Great, you know, what the hell? Let go of that damn meat body. Who needs it? Yeah. Hey, look at Let's now. Let's all kill ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Good. Let's all commit suicide. Look how happy I am. You know? Or you jump off the Empire State Building and say, now I'm free, you know? You're putting too much sympathy on your meat body. I know. Now, listen, let's get into the incredible string band. Because okay. I remember when I was in England uh, and I took my family over there for two periods of a year and three months each. And I was there and there's a town close to East, East Grinstead called Croydon. And we went to see the incredible string band at this theater. And I got to tell you, man, I think Robin Williamson, I think that was the main guy's name. And Licky McKechnie was in it and she was a singer and she would dance. But they had some incredible musicians. And even though that particular type of music is not really my cup of tea, I was enthralled with it. That show was incredible. Anyway, we brought this up earlier, and I would like to bring it up now. And if you could tell the story about that, yes, how it affected your life and Licky McKechnie. And by the way, if any of you were around in the old days, if you remember Licky McKechnie, where is she now? You know, and that's if you go on the internet, there's actually all these these internet sites asking where what happened to Licky. Um, I was married to Licky for three and a half years, and I would like to give you the story of Licky. It's never, I've written about it on blogs, but hopefully this, your show will be a key thing for people to go to, to find out about what happened to Licky, because she was my wife and I saw what happened to her and it was really sad. So let's back up a little bit. First of all, I saw them at Woodstock. Didn't like them, didn't even know who they were. Then a couple of years later, or maybe a year later, I was combing through some album covers. Remember when we, in, with books, with our record stores, we would go there and look at the album covers and spend oh, all yeah. day just looking. It was kind of fun to do. Oh yeah. So I was, I was doing that and I picked up this album cover and I had forgotten that I had seen them. So I didn't even know who they were. I made fun of them. So I, I opened up, I opened up this album cover and I see this face of this woman. The four of them are sitting in a, in, in, in a tree. It's a changing horses was the name of the album. And I see this beautiful face and I look at this beautiful face and I think to myself, I want to buy this album 
just because of this face. So I bought the album. I enjoyed their music. I used to take girlfriends of mine in New York to uh, the Fillmore East and to Lincoln Center to see them perform. I was a fan. I was a fanatical fan. They helped me get into Scientology because they were Scientologists. So one day when I'm still living in New York before I came out here, I'm sitting on the edge of the bed with my brother, Michael, and I'm looking at listening to the Incredible String Band, looking at the album cover. And I say to my brother, Michael, one day, Michael, I would love to marry her. I just would love to marry this woman, Licky McKechnie. So wow. a couple of years later, passed by. I come out to California uh, about a couple of days after I'm out here. A friend of mine says he has her phone number, gives her a call, says he wants to connect with this New Yorker guy. I meet her. And after two days of being together, we decide to get married. So this is the, this was like, what? So uh, talk about altitude instruction. I mean, she was like, I was infatuated here. I was a fan of this woman and, and she was an OT and she, she got me into Scientology. And I thought that the incredible string band were all these advanced, advanced beings, you know? Yeah. So, all right. So uh, I learned a, a few lessons about that. Number one, uh, one's idea of a celebrity has nothing to do with the reality of who they are as people. My, my, my ex-wife, Licky, was a sweetheart, but she had a lot of issues. I think now, in retrospect, I look back, she might have been abused by her dad because she had some, said some things. But this was during a time when people didn't talk about that, about child abuse that much back in the uh, 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 late 70s. Right. And Licky had bouts of anger and mystical delusions. All right. She was on OT3 Expanded. So this is what happened to this is what happened to my poor ex-wife Licky. When she when she was she told me when she was in uh, uh, Saint Hill, she used to get certificates for being the person who did solo auditing like for forty hours. She was doing forty hours a week of OT three stuff, work, you know, trying to get BTS out of her. So when she moved to uh, California after the band broke up, and then her money sort of dried out. She was stuck in what was called the non-interference zone, which is like when you're on this level OT3, this dangerous level, you have to, uh, you have to be really careful because if, if, if you're not careful, uh, you can go crazy. Well, my, my ex-wife, Licky, went crazy. She tried so hard to get auditing to help her. She started going insane. She started hearing voices. She started one day... I came back to our home and this is, this is something I want everybody to know. This is what happened to Licky, you guys. This is what happened to this beautiful singer that you all loved. This is what Scientology did to her. Okay. This has to be, I want this to be known. Okay. I go home and I hear somebody crying. I go into the bathroom and I see my ex-wife curled up in the fetal position underneath the sink in our bathroom with eyes, bloodshot red, tears coming down her face. She looks at me like, like a crazy person. She goes, I created OT3. I'm the one that created OT3. And she kept saying it over and over and over again. She was insane. And I didn't know what OT3 was at the time. You know, I was a, a good Scientologist and none of us really knew what, what that stuff was yet. And so I called up Asho to try to get her a review or to try to get her some type of handling or whatever, because she was desperate. She was insane. And so because she didn't have any money, they said they weren't going to help her. And then I got really angry. And I remember talking to the MAA or one of the people at AO in LA. I said, well, you got to help her because this woman showed me this letter from a flag missionary years ago that stated that the incredible string band got close to 60% of the entire UK staff. Oh, by the way, everybody, so, uh, the incredible string band were the opinion leaders of Scientology back in that day. They were like the Chick Corea. They were like the Tom Cruise. They got a lot of people into Scientology, including myself. But this letter from a missionary that was sent to Licky stated that when they did a survey, a flag sent out a survey to the UK to find out how the staff got into Scientology. 60% of all the UK staff in Scientology got in through the incredible string band. So I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. This is out of exchange. This woman helped to, to create the army of Scientologists in the UK, and they're not going to help her? And so I, I got so pissed off, so they finally they said, okay, we're going to give her a review. 
So they called me into the AO and they had me sign that if she killed herself, that they weren't responsible. They gave her a, a review for a couple of days, sent her back home, and she went even more insane. The final thing that happened, she became homeless. She ended up living in my backyard. Uh, she ended up living in vacant lots uh, in uh, uh, Pasadena. She lived in a vacant lot in Montrose. And she was happy living in a vacant lot. She had nothing. And she, every now and again, she would get a job uh, as a waitress. And she was crazy because she was in, in fear that people were going to recognize her, that she used to be a celebrity, and now she's waiting tables. So my poor wife, Licky, went completely insane. Now, on the internet, they say that the last they've ever heard of her, that she was seen crossing the Arizona desert by herself. That was the last people saw of her. And then there was another thing that somebody just came up with recently was she was spotted somewhere in Sacramento. Now, here's one of the reasons why she may have gone underground. Licky, in 1981, when the missions were disbanded and when Scientology was, was going crazy and people were leaving in droves, I, I left at that time. Licky, and I never stated this anywhere because I was always afraid that Scientology was going to find her or find me. But now that everything's out of and, and you know, the, the media is now they, they can't deal with all of us. Yeah. Licky was one of the first people to go into AO and steal the OT3 materials. She, because at that time, we thought that Scientology was being overtaken by thugs, which they were. We didn't know who they were, but yeah. we all knew that something weird was happening in 82. This is when your son started taking over. Right. And so Licky and us still being believing Scientologists, she thought that she was trying to save the technology, the tech, by stealing it from AO and getting it into the field. And she wanted to give it to me because she felt that I, being a spiritual person, would get more a lot of benefit out of the OT3 materials. So she went to the AO with her little, you know, like a clip on her <laughs> attache case. Right, yeah. She goes in there and says, oh, I want to do a retread. I want to study something to the course soup. Okay, fine. So what she does, she takes the materials, she puts them in her attache case, and then she goes to Charlie Chan's, which is a copy place. And as she's copying the OT3 materials, there's a, there's a Sea Org member that's like right next to her doing, oh, hi, Licky, how are you? Says, oh, fine. You know, here she's Unbelievable. copying the OT3 materials. So she didn't tell me she was doing this. So this is like after we were divorced, you know, we, were got, we, we weren't officially divorced, but we were happily not going to be married together anymore. So she comes to my house. She goes, Brian, I have a surprise for you. Here's the OT3 materials. What? And she goes, but but can you just give me the money for, you know, for the copies? So, Ron, I spent 35 cents on OT3. I think that's one of my proudest moments in life. Unbelievable. And, uh, I don't think anybody else could ever <laughs> say that they spent 35 cents on OT3. <laughs> that's, Maybe so, 36 cents, but not 35. <laughs> <laughs> that's the price of copies. So that's one of the reasons I think Licky went underground, because she went underground at a time when they were going after people violently. Yeah. For, for that and 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 so so that's what happened to licky everybody uh, scientology drove her insane the ot3 materials she's constantly looking for body thetans in her bodies eight hours a day you know trying to figure out and and, and saying this is how i'm going to be happy this is how i'm going to overcome my problems this is how i'm going to become a better person this is how i'm going to become spiritually enlightened by listening to bts in my head drove my wife insane she became schizophrenic Wow. There was one time when we were walking down the street and there were birds chirping. And she goes, oh, she stopped me and she goes, oh, let's listen. The Ned, to, the Ned for OT completions are talking to me, are guiding me through the, through the tweeting of the birds. This is what happened to her. Wow. And I think that there's a certain mindset that once they get on the OT levels, it's going to drive them insane. Because number one, the, the OT levels essentially – are a victim uh, level. Why do I say that? Because on the OT levels, Ron's saying all your unwanted thoughts don't come from you. All your unwanted feelings don't come from you. All the pains in the body that you have don't come from you. They come from somebody else. So yeah. what is that? That is a perfect description of a victim philosophy. Yeah. 
So instead of these are my thoughts to deal with, my poor wife in this crazy state of hers assigned all of her problems to these imaginary voices in her head, which which exacerbated an already uh, an all uh, an already predisposition for mental instability, and she became a homeless person. And people don't know this. Scientology helped to destroy her. If she's alive, if she's listening to me, all I can say is, Licky, I love you. Licky, thank you for uh, uh, getting me the OT3 materials. It freed me from this darkness, you know, because the mystery sandwich of not knowing what the OT3 level was, was sticking me in Scientology. Thank you for freeing me from it. And I hope that you're doing well. I hope you're still alive. And I hope you're happy and healthy wherever you are. Nobody's going to hurt you. Scientology's not going to hurt you. There's too many people out there criticizing you right now. If you want to surface, I would love to see you. That's all I can say. And it was a hard experience for me. You have no idea the mental anguish I experienced seeing this woman go down the drain like that, not knowing what to do. And seeing my church saying, uh, sorry, uh, we're not going to help you anymore. Bye-bye. That was the moment I went, you know what? This is a fucking business. This is not a religion. This is yeah. not trying to help people. These people want money because here is a celebrity that helped them to get 60% of their entire staff in the UK to staff the army of Scientology and they would not help her because she had no money. That is out exchange. And that's what Scientology always talks about. Don't go out exchange. Scientology described to me they were criminals and they did not care about the well-being of souls they do not care about the well-being of human beings they only care about their own power and getting money and that's why i left this dark metaphysical organization and brian oh, i hope i had some emotion on that one <laughs> well i tell you i think we're going to end the show with that i don't think i'm going to take that any further because thank that you ron uh, no, that that's wonderful, and no, it's not wonderful that it fucking happened. I don't mean that, but you got your plea out to Licky. Who knows? Could happen. You may get a call from her. Let's let's hope for that. Let's hope for the best. And God bless you, Licky, okay. wherever you are, and all you people out there that are hurting from Scientology. God bless all of you. It's okay. There's other refuges. Spirit. There's other spiritual ref uh, places to go to. Go to your friends. Go back to your family. You don't need to stay there. It's not your fault. You're not evil. The evil came from L. Ron Hubbard. I'm sorry to say, but that is true. And with that, and I'd just like to say, if you care to help in this endeavor, become a Patreon. It would I would appreciate it very much. And the other way you could help, as a matter of fact, we help a lot. Get other people to subscribe and watch these episodes because what you heard here is uh, the real deal. These, these are people who have experienced this and are willing to stand up and be heard. And uh, I appreciate it very much. And Brian, thank you very much for coming back on with me. I very much appreciate this. Thank you, Ron. Okay, my pleasure. So I'm Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. I'll see you on the next episode.